The following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace. Have you ever suffered a major financial setback? I sure have, and I don't like it how it feels one bit. Just about everybody I know in my extended friend and family network has experienced some setbacks. Why does that happen? Well, for one, the economy can go south, and it happens periodically, doesn't it? It did in 87, in 2001, and a big one in 2008. Or people experience disabilities or some major health breakdowns, or they're laid off from their jobs for an extended period of time and burn up a lot of their savings just to operate, just to survive. I'd like to dig into God's Word with you today and find strength and resources that God provides there for us so that we can be survivors even in a time of financial loss. You're all going to suffer financial loss. Some of you have already. You've been hit by the financial nuclear bomb already. But whether it was in your past or whether it still awaits you that anvil's hanging over your head and it's going to come down on you in the future, or maybe you are struggling financially right now because of some kind of disaster. We all suffer it. In 2008, when the market had its terrible, sickening drop and we went into recession, anybody with savings saw the vaporization of somewhere between a quarter and a third or maybe as much as a half of whatever savings you may have. Just paper wealth that suddenly just like it got burnt up as though stacks of your money were put into a bonfire and just burnt up and it disappeared. Just went away. Just suddenly was not there because it was paper wealth. There are hundreds of ways to suffer financial disaster. But as I listen to your stories, as you tell me things about the adventures of your life, I've heard your stories of pain. And there are more coming. As long as we live, there are going to be financial reversals. And today, we're going to be ready. Maybe it, you'll hear things today you wish you had known in your horrible time of 10 years ago. Maybe you will remember the, this conversation when a disaster or reverse hits you, like a breadwinner gets ill or disabled, or a breadwinner goes and dies on you and suddenly pinches off the family's reliable income stream. Or maybe you're in it right now, and I'm talking about your life right this minute. Either way, we're going to hear some words of encouragement from a man who wrote once to his friends, I know what it's like to live on both ends of the spectrum. I have lived high, where I've dressed well and eaten well, but I also know what it's like to have nothing. And that would be our friend, the Apostle Paul. I'd like you to take your Bible and open it up to the book of Philippians in chapter 3. And we're going to read a paragraph maybe two if time permits, where he's going to help us take inventory of our lives and have a little financial check on how, how you feel. Most of you would not say, I'm, I'm wealthy or I'm rich. Paul helps us to see where our treasures really lie and the many ways in which we truly are rich and wealthy, even if we have suffered some financial reverses. He's writing to the Philippians. I don't know if you've ever been in Philippi. I never have. But what I have learned about Philippi is that it was in northern Macedonia, which is sort of north Greece. They're the Greeks' cousins, spoke the same language. And uh, Philippi was in a mining region. But the mines were mostly played out. You know what happens when the mines give out and there's no longer a profitable way to extract, in this case, gold. They were gold mines. When, when you can't find gold anymore, the circus leaves town. Well, that was Philippi. And although it had been used as a military colony, and although there was some farmland around it, its glory days as a mining boom town were over. And the people there, Paul wrote, were the poorest among all of the congregations that he planted. And yet, out of their poverty, their lack of money, oddly enough, made them even more interested in the gospel. And Paul found that, I think, in Philippi, that they turned out to be his most generous contributors to his project to raise money for famine relief back in Jerusalem. Anyway, 2 chapter 3, verse 7, Paul took a personal audit of his own life 
And he had been completely changed. In his younger years, for him, status was everything. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He bragged on, I, am, I can out-Jewish anybody. I am a Jewish stud boy. I am the, the young hope of Israel. I am going to earn God's favor. And he did it in sometimes the most horrible ways by actually persecuting the very Messiah that Israel was supposed to be waiting for. And he was completely, his life was completely turned around on the road to Damascus. Now he writes showing how his whole worldview has changed. And I put this out there for you so that you are choosing the right markers and the right measuring sticks to know if your life is a success and thus if, if, you're, if you have a happy life or not. Here's what he says. In verse 7, Paul writes, Whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. It's got a whole new auditing system, whole new accounting system. It's as though he had been using the wrong software to measure his life. What I used to be so proud of is nothing to me. The prestige, the financial success that the Pharisees generally had, that old boy network that was going to be my way to advance, uh, to, to be somebody. He said, what's more, frankly, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. He accumulated no financial treasures. He lived from one week to the next. He didn't know how he was going to eat. He lived off of the charity of others. Not as a beggar, he worked harder than anybody. In fact, there were certain places in his traveling ministry where in order not to be a burden on a baby congregation, he served them for nothing. And he had a side job as a canvas worker in order to support himself. He had learned that the great treasures in my life, my profitability is not based on money. And although he was on his way to the upper crust as a young man, he gave that up and lived humbly, even working his way through his ministry so that he could give it away. For he found my greatest treasure, my greatest asset on my balance sheet are not, is not my portfolio. They're not my gold drachmas that I have in, hidden or I got on deposit in a bank somewhere or in a secret chest somewhere. My greatest assets are, and here he tells us, it's knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. I consider all of my previous assets of which I was so proud, my righteousness, my social status, my money, that's all rubbish, he said, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. If Christ loves and accepts and justifies me, I'm a millionaire and I have everything. If I don't have that, I've got nothing but rubbish. When the lights go on at the end, I will have been found to be holding in my hands junk that is useless. I want to be found in him. I don't have a righteousness of my own that comes from the law. In other words, my performance is not what induces God to like me. And if I have God, I've got everything. If I don't have him, I've got nothing. But it's not based on my performance. It's based on Christ. He had to carry around with him wherever he went the painful memories of having led persecutions that arrested and even killed Christians. He personally approved of and supervised the stoning of Stephen. He was the coat check boy clapping and cheering as people picked up stones and threw them so many and so hard and aiming at the head that it killed someone who joyfully confessed Christ and gave his life in a relief ministry to bring help to people who were struggling financially. And he loved it and was proud of it. Now he has to walk around with the memories of his miserable failure. Same as you and I walk around with memories of our failures in the past. But here's the sweet thing. Forgiven by Jesus Christ, they just become harmless scars. They are no longer crippling, we're no longer bleeding, we're no longer diseased. The scars simply remind us of what idiots we were capable of being in the past, but how great the mercy of God is that for Jesus' sake, 
he washes us clean and then heals those wounds and sets us free to serve him. And what that does is it changes your whole value system. What am I chasing? What do I care about? How am I dialed in to what God is going to do in my life? Here's what Paul said. What I care about, what matters to me, is that which is through faith in Christ, a righteousness that comes from God, not from me, from God. And it's by faith I believe it. I'm not awarded it as a medal for my performance. I'm given what someone else has done. I want to know Christ. I don't want to build my portfolio as my first goal. I don't want to accumulate cash, which is worthless on the day of Christ. I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings. May I confess that I don't have the same juice as Paul. I have never prayed for the thrill of enjoying fellowship with Christ in his sufferings. I just, I'm not up to it yet. But I'm young. There's time. I might yet. But I've got this personal philosophy, no pain, no pain. <laughs> I'm a pain avoider. Man, I, I will walk a half a mile to avoid a difficult situation. I run from stress and pain. Paul says, I have learned the joy. I, I'm thrilled for my sufferings. And man, he took a load of it because it just means that I'm in the footsteps of my Savior. I have fellowship in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death because then, of course, I tie into the resurrection. Now, it's not as though you earn everlasting life by the degree of bloodshed or pain you've been administered to on this earth. What it means is that you count things differently. He took enormous amounts of physical abuse because he represented Jesus Christ. In fact, one time, people who were not worthy to tie the laces of his sandals threw stones at him as they had at Stephen. And the only reason he didn't die at that moment is they thought they'd killed him already. Obviously, he went down. Obviously, he was bleeding. He must have taken some shots to the head. They thought they'd finished him off. And his friends tiptoed back after the stoning was over and dragged him to safety where they nursed him back to health. But his body, I'm sure, bore the scars. He was flogged on more than one occasion. There were scars on his back just like those photographs from the Civil War era of uh, what the abolitionists used, photographs of slaves who had been flogged showing their scars and welts across their back. Paul had them too. And he said, frankly, I don't care. That, does, that means nothing to me. The fact that I have no assets, no tangible assets, means nothing to me. My asset sheet shows that I carry the righteousness of Christ. And you know what that meant was he knew that God was going to take care of him because he was dialed into God's agenda. And his lack of money did not make him feel like a failure. I was uh, reading devotionally in the book of Leviticus this past week, and I had to be thinking how odd it would be when you are a kid going with your daddy for the first time to wherever the tabernacle was or later in Jerusalem where the temple was, and you'd watch your agricultural, your farm daddy bring his offerings. Maybe you raised wheat and you'd watch them bring bar barrels of wheat and dump them into the great furnace in front of the tabernacle or in front of the temple and just burn it up. And you might say, Daddy, that could have kept our family alive for a week. You're just burning it up and now it's gone. What a waste. Or if your family was into the raising of grapes and you would bring um, some vats of the first fruits of your harvest, you would dump it out as what was called a drink offering. You'd pour it onto the ground. And I could imagine a kid, like a middle school kid, going, what a waste. I, I tended those vines. I raised those grapes. I cut them. I trampled them and strained them. We made this wonderful wine. What a waste. You're just dumping it out. Or if you had livestock, you'd bring your animals and they would kill the animals. And if it was a certain type of sacrifice called the fellowship offering or a whole offering, meaning you are wholly dedicating yourself to the Lord, do you know what you did with that animal? First you'd kill it and then you'd burn the whole thing. And if I'm 11 or 12, I'm going, what a waste. 
And I think God did that as a challenge to them. First, do not measure your wealth in terms of your stuff. Your relationship with me is far more important. I don't need, those cattle all belong to me anyway. I don't need their blood. I don't drink their blood, he explains in Psalm 50. That is an exercise I'm putting you through for your benefit, not primarily for me. I don't need your dead animals. They don't, it doesn't help my agenda any. What does help my agenda is when you let go of your stuff and trust me. Do you, do you really believe that I am cause and effect in the world? Do you believe or not that I am engaged in the lives of men and women and kids or not? Do you believe that I can make more? And the burning up of 10% of their offerings was an act of worship. He's going to make more tomorrow than I can't see yet. And what that does is it helps you let go and it helps you exhale and relax. God's at work in my life and God already lives in tomorrow and he's going to be there to help us. So they could offer their gifts knowing there will be more. We're not going to starve. It was an act of faith. We're trusting you. We are hereby declaring we think you already live in tomorrow and you've already set in motion a support network that's going to help me. One of the things that happens when you suffer a financial reverse, uh, which is not always bad, sometimes God uses our financial reverses to teach us a few things. Uh, I don't know, do you get panhandled a lot? I sure do. I, I get panhandled every week, sometimes multiple times. And usually I just say no, I, I just do not encourage that. But sometimes when I'm not in a hurry and I want to be kind of pastoral, I will actually talk with the people for a while. And I, and I ask them, where, where is your brother? Where are your relatives? Why are you begging on the street? Where's your sister? Where is your mother? Where is your father? Do you talk to your father or have you fried all your relationships with your family? Do you have children? Do you have an uncle or an auntie? Wouldn't you be angry and humiliated if one of your blood relatives was panhandling on the street? You'd want to shake them and rattle them. Don't do that. Come and talk to me. If you're struggling, talk to me. And here's one of the things that financial reverses does. It really reminds us we need each other. And God invented the family as his number one anti-poverty measure in the world, especially marriage. If you are married, you get married and stay married, your family's likelihood of uh, entering into poverty has already been slashed by 50%, probably more than that. It's also a reminder you need God. And poverty, uh, having nothing and struggling is a way to bring God closer. And God views that as a plus. You may not like it at first, but it's a plus. I got to tell you, the times in my life when I had very little and I was isolated, I have never read my Bible more eagerly and my prayers have never been more intense than the times when I was reminded on a daily basis how much I depended on the Lord. And I think the Lord gives us as much as he dares. And sometimes he prunes because getting too much can wreck our faith even harder than not having enough. So very likely your life is going to be like Paul's. He wrote to the Philippians, I know what it's like to have plenty. I know what it's like to have nothing. I've learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things through him who gives me strength. But notice the key is the through him. It's your relationship with Christ. And Paul says, that is my greatest asset. When I got that, I got everything. So ponder this, remember this. When your life goes into a down financial cycle, you are not to interpret that as a sign of God's anger or judgment. He's not punishing you. Let it be part of his pruning process. Humble yourself and look around and say, God, I need you more than ever. I'm counting on you to do what you promised. You said you would provide me with daily bread. Maybe not daily tiramisu, maybe not daily fillets, but I will eat. Hold, I hold you to that promise to give me enough. Just give me enough. And also, 
let it increase and improve your hearing and relationships that you are not too proud to say, I need help, and count on your family to be there to help you. But let God's pruning also show you that his ultimate mission is not to have all of you at the end of your life have a magnificent asset base, that your estate when you croak is really awesome. That's not God's markers of what he considers a successful life, but that you cherish your Savior Jesus as your greatest asset and that you have given Christ away to as many people as you can and made him look good in your sphere of influence. That is a life of satisfaction. That is going to bring you more joy and more comfort at the end of your life than uh, how big your equities and how big your, uh, your bond portfolio is. That is going to bring you a great satisfaction because every tangible thing in your life is going to be taken from you, like it or not. But what lasts forever are your relationships with people and with your God. Therefore, here's our little finale. Not that I've already obtained all this, verse 12, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He's even giving Jesus credit for his conversion. Brothers, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, straining toward what's ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. So when all this drama is going on in your life, don't look in the rear view. No complaining, no recriminations, no blaming other people. Windshield everybody, not the rear view. Look ahead, drive forward. Call on God to keep his promises and remember that you and I are heaven bound and that is the time when we can thank Paul for giving us encouragement of how to be survivors in what is often a tough life. Coping with even financial loss is not the end of everything but it may just be part of God's overall design to help get us to the finish line with our faith strong and intact. This is good news for God's people because it means that our God reigns and he's still in charge. Let all God's people say, Amen. God tells us that heaven will be amazing. But when you're facing a terminal illness or your spouse just died of cancer, life after death can seem scary and far away. If you or others you know need to be reminded of the guarantee of heaven that we have through Jesus, we'd love to send you a reason for hope, overcoming earthly struggles and looking forward to heaven. This resource is a collection of prayers and messages including A Better World is Coming Guaranteed, Life After Death, and What Will Heaven Be Like? that will help you find assurance in God's promises and look forward to a life with Him eternally. Call 800-661-3311, visit timeofgrace.org slash store, or text the word TIME to 313131 to receive a copy of A Reason for Hope as a thank you for your financial gift to Time of Grace. It gives me great pleasure to have a moment to say thank you to all of the people whose ongoing financial support makes Time of Grace possible. If you have enjoyed today's program, I hope that you would love to continue to reinvest to make sure it keeps coming. We have no other source of support other than our viewers and readers. Thank you. If you haven't recently made a financial contribution to Time of Grace, let me invite you today to pray and consider your best gift and join the team. I would love to have you as one of my Grace partners. You know, I've been talking about coping with loss and a letter came from one of our viewers that really has touched my heart and she may be speaking for some of you as well. Let me share her words. She writes in uh, to, to me at Time of Grace, I've had a very rough last couple of years and financially things just keep getting worse. I've been struggling to get my life together and I lost my job a couple of weeks ago and I'm on the edge of homelessness. I just don't know how much more I can take. Would you please pray for me and give me some hope? Doesn't that just hit you right there? Here is somebody 
whose life just seems to be collapsing, where it's very bleak and there seems to be no hope. The first thing to do, and we're going to do that in just a minute, is to pray for her. I'd like to invite you to join me in praying for this dear woman so that her life will become stabilized and ask for God's intervention. Another strategy when we really kind of hit the wall like this is we gain a new appreciation for the value and importance of our families. This is the time for the family to come together to help somebody in a time of need. Everybody has got somebody you're connected to. And maybe it's you who has a need and you're running out of resources. Don't be too proud to go to your family and ask for help. Maybe you're the one with the resources and there's a family member that you know is struggling. Don't make them beg, don't make them struggle. But put another place at the table. Share some of your resources and give them another chance. And I'd like to ask now if you would like to join me in praying for this woman. Let's pray for all people who really feel like they are out of financial options and that they are on the edge of homelessness themselves. Heavenly Father, we come to you today to pray for your mercy, your generous, kind mercy for someone you know and love named Tawana. She seems to feel like she's on the edge of having no options left, that all her financial resources are being depleted. We pray, first of all, that you will keep her going. Don't let her lose her home. Secondly, we pray that you will help a job to materialize that is just right for her. Help her get back to work. She wants to work. Lord, help her with a job. Connect her with her family so that in a time of crisis, their family will pull together and help her and in increase their bonds of love and strengthen their family ties. And finally, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to give her hope that while she has to wait when times are bleak, that she will not give up hope but continue to trust in you. Lord, we pray for not only Tawana but all the Tawanas out there, some of them that we know, and we pray that you will help them in their time of need. And let them see that it was your intervention so that they give you the praise and the glory. Lord, don't let any of your children suffer. Take care of those you call your own. In Jesus' name, amen. For Time of Grace, I'm Pastor Mark Jeske. Every day is a day of God's amazing grace for you. Helping you reach the next level of your Christian life is a driving passion for Mark Jeske and the ministry team at Time of Grace. When you visit timeofgrace.org, you'll find more resources than ever, including video extras, social media connections, new products, plus our prayer ministry, all at timeofgrace.org. And pray about becoming a Grace Partner, an exclusive group of partners and donors who are committed to help us expand Mark Jeske's teaching ministry around the world. Just call 1-800-661-3311 or visit us at timeofgrace.org. Thanks for watching and join us again next time for Mark Jeske and Time of Grace. The preceding program has been made possible by the friends and partners of Time of Grace.